Hello everybody, my name is Manuel and uh, welcome. Today I want to talk to you about social anxiety and specifically I want to give you three, a three-step system to overcome social anxiety. And the system has many steps within the actual three steps which I'm going to talk to uh, about a little bit later. So let's get started. First of all I want to talk a little bit about what is social anxiety. And obviously Social anxiety is spelled without an R, so um, excuse my, my typo there. So I want to introduce you to Tom. Tom is 26 years old, and you can see him here in the picture. And Tom is at a party, and the party sounds a little bit like this. That's it. So there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of people around, and as you can see in the picture, um, there's a big crowd. However, Tom is very shy and he's also single and he's been single for his whole life. Um, he feels all alone in the middle of the whole crowd. Even though there's many people around him, he doesn't really feel like there's many people around him because all he notices is himself all alone in the middle of, uh, of a big crowd. So he also feels like everyone is looking at him. And not only are they looking at him, but they're judging him. For instance, this gets very bad if Tom um, is standing all by himself, all alone, and there's nothing to do, like no drink or nothing to eat. And then he notices people looking at him, and he immediately makes up the stories in his head. Okay, they're looking at me. They see that I have nobody to talk to or that I'm not doing anything particular. And they must think I'm weird and boring, and, you know, they must not like me. So he convinced himself. Even before they've ever said a word to him, he is convinced that people have judged him in a negative way. Um, of course, as a result of him being completely self-focused and he has very little awareness of his surroundings and of the people that, you know, are in the room, the rest of the people. So, what is happening is that he cannot really relate to other people because his completely focus is in his in his own head and he makes up the stories he talks to himself constantly and he has this worry in his head about how he's going to look to other people and you know what they're going to think about him and he's afraid that he won't have anything interesting to say in case he ends up being in a conversation so if someone comes up to him to talk to he already convinced himself beforehand that you know they are eventually going to leave because I'm not interesting and I have nothing interesting to say and you won't like me so this results, of course, to Tom not having very many friends, and he kind of feels trapped in his life. So he doesn't really feel like he can enjoy his life and do the things that he wants to do. Um, and the reason I want to talk to, uh, about this today is that many people are like Tom. And as you might have figured, Tom is not um, a, a fictional character. Tom actually exists, and Tom is one of many people that I interviewed in a social anxiety blog and forum where people help each other to overcome this issue. And the reason that I want to talk about this is because this is a very serious issue for me and it's especially in the country that I live in. I live in a northern European country where people are not very social or very open. And not because they don't want to be, but because that's the cultural way that they have been programmed. And it's very hard to break out of that. And people enjoy having this very big space. And uh, I'm partly Spanish, so I like to talk to people. I like to be social. I like to, you know, sometimes um, just to go up to people and talk to them. And they feel sometimes uncomfortable because they're very shocked when that happens. And the reason that social anxiety is um, so close to me personally is because I used to be very, very, very shy when I grew up. And the earliest memory I have of social anxiety impacting my life in a very negative way was when I was about six or seven years old. And when I was six or seven, um, I used to be in the first or second class of, of school. And between those breaks, or between the lessons we had those breaks, like 20 minutes breaks, 25 minutes breaks, in which we had to go out of the building to get some fresh air and we had this playground where we can play. But the thing was that we were not allowed to go back into the building uh, until the break was over. So, for instance, 
20 minutes the first break and we had to stay outside to play. And I remember I needed to go to pee, like really badly. And I was six, seven years old, first year in school. And I went up to the door to go in, but there was always a teacher. And he wouldn't let the students in. Of course, if they really had to pee, he would let the students in. A lot of students try to kind of get, you know, get past them and fake that they need to pee just to get in. And if you were caught getting in, um, even though you didn't really have to pee or anything, you would have to do extra work. So what happened is I really needed to pee and I went to the teacher and he just stopped me and he was like, stop, you cannot go in. And instead of saying, okay, I really need to pee, please let me in, I was so intimidated by, by the way he said stop and, you know, he said, no way, you're not going to get in here. Um, that I, I didn't say anything. I didn't raise, I raised my voice and said, hey, I really need to pee or, you know, I just, all right, I was really intimidated. I was shy and I put my head down. I was like, okay. And I had to wait more and I tried to hold it, but I couldn't. And well, I'm not particularly proud to say that um, I ended up wetting myself that day. And when break was over, uh, all my, you know, the, the friends in school and so on, they noticed that, of course. And, they started making fun of it, and, and this single memory has stayed with me ever since. And this is one of the many ways that um, the shyness impacted my life and the lack of assertiveness to say things. So, and I'm sure that many people like Tom, in different ways, like that you cannot fully enjoy life because there's some things, some social obstacles that hold you back. So interesting enough. Um, social anxiety occurs in women twice as often as in men. So they're not only Toms, they're a lot of Sandys as well, or Daisies, or Lindas, or whatever you want to call them. And um, it may be caused by the way you grow up, or it may be um, caused by inheritance, or both. And that's actually true. Um, the way you're born and genetically wired determines if you're more likely to actually grow up socially anxious or not and I'm going to talk about this a little bit, a little bit um, later more in detail and people with social anxiety are of course less likely to have full-time jobs or the job that they truly want they end up settling for jobs that make them feel comfortable for instance a job where they have to work alone in an office and not interact with other people even though they might hate that job or they might they're not able to go to their boss and ask for a promotion a raise even though they're doing a great job, but they just, you know, they have this blockage and they can't get over that. So, and a big misconception of those people is that they're rude or they do not want to make friends or be social in general. But that's a big mistake because there's nothing more in the world that those people want than to have friends or to be friendly and, you know, to enjoy. And these people are very friendly people. And most of them are, are like um, also very, very good people and very humble people. But the problem is that when you go up to someone, you say hi, and they don't respond to you, very often what, what we do is we think, okay, they're very rude. I mean, why would you not say hi back or, you know? But what we don't understand is that these people have problems saying hi back. Like, they don't know how to. And they're so scared of it. It's irrational, but, but it's really like this. And also, they will not tell you that they're scared of it because they fear that once they tell you, you think they might be weird and judge them again. And there's one thing that social anx uh, socially anxious people are very afraid of, and that's being judged and rejected. So they will avoid every any situation in which there might be the risk that they are being judged or, or rejected. So, and these people know that their fear is irrational. And so a lot of people try to um, doctors and other other um, practitioners of um, or people who try to coach people and help them try to target this issue at a logical basis and it does not work because those people know that their fear is irrational so telling them that you know there's nothing to be afraid of and being rational to them will not work they know that so it's not that simple and also, seven people, uh, seven percent of our population, is affected by SAD, social anxiety disorder, at any given time. So this is the third biggest um, psychological disorder that uh, we have currently in the world. So it's a big thing. It's a big thing. And many, many, uh, for instance, um, 
celebrities, they also, before they really excelled at what they do, were socially anxious people. And there's been documented um, uh, from movie stars up to basketball players and so on that these people stayed at home for several weeks and cried themselves to sleep. And you can you can just research it yourself and put like celebrities socially anxious and so on. And you will realize that many people that nowadays are very successful have this incredible anxiety or had it, incredible anxiety within themselves. And you would never guess that because the people are very good at hiding that. And what basically happens with social anxious people is that they are in a constant state of worry and anxiety. And it's killing. It's, it's horrible. It's not very easy to deal with. When whatever you want to do is so hard to do, and you're constantly worrying about what would happen. You cannot even go to the shop. Imagine this, you go to... It's hard for you to go into a shop and buy a liter of milk or whatever and go to the cashier. It's very hard and you might freak out. Imagine that. It's not that easy. So, it all comes down to comfort. These people value comfort um, above anything. And then I wrote down comfort kills. And why? Because what happens is if you value comfort anything uh, above anything other than um, than other, 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 any other value, then you will do anything in order to feel comfortable. And you will do that at the expense of all your other values, if that makes sense. So I asked those people when I interviewed them, what do you value most? Do you value most comfort or love? And this comfort comes from my own experience because I looked at myself and I thought, what do I value most? And it turns out it was comfort. So I was like, this is interesting. Let me see if other people feel the same way. So I asked them, do you value, what do you value most, comfort or love? And the uh, immediate answer was always love. And I thought, okay, you know, um, that's interesting. So let me ask you this. Would you be, would you rather fear, uh, feel loved but uncomfortable? Or would you rather feel comfortable but unloved? And then they still say, I would rather be loved than comfortable. And then I say, okay. And now look at the actions in your life. Have you ever in your life felt uncomfortable in order to feel loved? Or have you ever felt unloved in order to be comfortable? And usually what happens, that's very interesting. People come up with examples of where they wanted to feel loved, but they rather set it for comfort. And so they wanted to go for it and make a move or something. They knew that if they did that, they would feel loved but they would feel very uncomfortable. So there's a lot of instances that people can give me where they settle for comfort and uh, they rather were comfortable but unloved. And there's almost no example, no example that these people could give me where they made themselves feel uncomfortable in order to feel loved. So that's a very interesting thing. So that's uh, these people value comfort very, very highly above any other thing. And... Uh, that is that is the root of the problem. And that needs to be changed. And it's, that's where to start, not with medicine and that the other thing. And what happens is that if you keep doing that, you will miss out on the love that you want. You will miss out on the social friends, on the social cycles that you want to have the vacation and you know the fun times with your friends that you want. And even on your dream jobs, you will not have your dream jobs. <laughs> Maybe it's not this one, but whatever your dream job is you most likely not to achieve your dream job because all of the social obstacles in your way. So, that's a problem. So let's go to the three steps to finally start living. And the reason I phrase it like that is because I also ask those people, um, what is your most common, biggest frustration that you have currently? And uh, the number one response is that I don't feel like I have started to live. My biggest frustration is to start living, to start my life. So I thought about this very long, and um, when I started learning this stuff six years ago, uh, actually I first started um, with a frustration of not being able to meet and date uh, women, and I learned social skills there. And once I learned that, I was like, okay, you know, part of that is body language, so I went to study body language. And then I learned body language influences your um, psychology and the, the way you feel, and then I started learning neurolinguistic programming, and I was like, okay. Now I went to psychology, and I, all these things, step by step, helped me to get up. And I realized that when I first tried to get more social, I was completely starting in the wrong direction. 
you know, I was trying to get like tricks and stuff and it took me four, five, six years later that, you know, more that I actually realized that, you know, there's more easy steps to work on that, more effective steps. So I want to line out um, three main steps that I think uh, are critical to um, resolve this issue. Number one is to redirect the massive pain and anxiety against itself. People who are socially anxious already feel a lot of pain and anxiety in their life. So people think it's a bad thing and they try to fight it. Instead, look at it as something very useful. It's like you have already this massive emotional drive. And instead of trying to fight it and get rid of it, you can just re-channel it against itself to create massive motivation. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about how to do that. Step two is to understand what you do and interrupt patterns of behavior. Most of the behavior that you do and even the thoughts that you think every day are automatic. You're on autopilot most of the time. So becoming aware of when you are getting into the habit of doing something bad that's not beneficial to you is very critical because most of the time we're not aware of that. And uh, for me, an example for me, that's something that I, I, I used to do a very long time is to, to pick up my, my phone when I feel anxious. And when I'm in a social situation, I, I used to pick up my phone and pretend I'd have a conversation on my phone, even though, I, even though nobody was on the phone. But I was just there and like, hello, blah, blah, because I felt very uncomfortable just standing in the middle of a room or at a party or a social gathering or whatever, um, not doing anything, like no, no drink, no anything. And, and uh, you know, that's the thing. And more, that's very interesting because many people, when they go out, for instance, to a bar or a club or any other environment, the first thing they do is go to a bar and get a drink. Not because they like drinking so much, actually. But many people do that so they have something in their hand to hold to. You know, and to become aware of, you know, when you grab that phone is critical because now when I did that, every time I go there, I just slap my hand and I'm, I completely like break out of the pattern and then I replace the pattern. I'm going to talk a little bit later um, also about how to do that. And step three is to refill your mind positively and to reinforce new behavior. Because once you catch yourself doing the old thing, you have to replace that and you have to replace it all the time. And you have to go back into it and then, you know, change the behavior all the time until it becomes automatic. So, and then you have to do it on a, on a regular basis. Excuse me. Yeah, I have the flu. It's really cold outside and it's snowing. So, yeah, I catch the flu. I'm sorry for that. But, yeah, let's continue. And there are certain steps between each of these that I want to outline. First of all, in step one, you have to do a commitment and burn the bridges. And I'm going to talk to about this a little bit in a, in a second. Next, I want to talk about internal resources versus medication. Most people rely on medication. The first thing is they do, they, went to, they go to a doctor, and the doctor says, here, have some Xanax or have some other beta blocker that might help you. Not the way to go. Next, I want to talk about motivation. What motivates you and how to use pain and pleasure. And also about the compelling future. You have to know why you're doing what you're doing, otherwise you're not going to follow through. So this is the thing. The step one gives you the basis to follow through, to make sure that the advice you get later is going to be applied. Because even if I tell you or I help you um, by telling you the certain steps that you can do and techniques that you can do, if you don't use them, they're of no value. So that's why I include the first step to actually you know, help you motivate. Number two, um, you have to change the meaning of events. Why? I'm going to talk about this also in a sec. Then you have to zoom out. And I use an um, analogy of the room on fire and how that works. Um, you know, I'm going to explain that in a second as well. And you have to do something you did not think was possible for you because you have to break out of that comfort. You feel comfortable your whole life, you have to break out of that. And the way of doing that, there's two ways. Working on beliefs or working on your actions. And... Um, Again, in a second, we'll people uh, dig a little bit deeper into that. In step three, you have to anchor your new behavior, and you have to unplug yourself from resistance. Because if there's all around you, if there's people and things in your environment that's resisting your change, it's going to be very hard to get where you want to go. So let's start with the commitment part. And I thought about this a lot. And you need a commitment to do anything. If you don't commit to anything, you're very likely not to get where you want to go. 
So I thought, okay, so you need to make a decision and commit. And then I looked up the word decision, and it turns out it comes from a Latin, decidere. And what that means literally is to cut off. To cut off what? Well, to cut off all the other options that you have. And I was like, okay, interesting. Um, so how does this apply? Well, if you think about what are decisions that you made today, think about what are decisions you made today. And there's at least two. I know that every single view on this video did. And I know this because you cut off all the other options. Number one, you got out of bed. You woke up and you got out of bed. Yes, that was a decision. You could have stayed in bed. But if you want to do anything in your day and to use your time, you have no option but to get out of bed. There is no other way. If you want to do something with your day, you have to get out of bed. If you do not get out of bed, you're not going to get anywhere. So there is no other option. You cut off all the other options. Number two, you ate. Breakfast, lunch, maybe some brunch, whatever. It depends on the time when you're watching this. But I'm pretty sure you ate something today. And if not, you're going to eat. And so why? Because if you want to continue living, you have to take a nourishment. And if you do not take a nourishment or eat, well, you're not going to live. So there's no other option um, than to go and eat and go to the fridge or go to a restaurant. And so these are the decisions we make on a daily basis without effort. They're automatic. So what is the difference between this decision that you make and between sending this one email that you had to send for three weeks or, you know, buying this new pair of shoes? Well, okay, for our female viewers, uh, buying a new pair of shoes it's probably not that hard, and it's not going to be procrastinated. In fact, she will come back with 10 pairs of shoes and say, Honey, look, they were on sale, and they're so pretty. But that's not the point. The point is, like, the decisions that you procrastinate all the time, and the decisions that you make automatically, what is the difference? It's this, you know, one, you cut off all the other options. There's no other way. And the other ones, you have no emotional drive to send that email. Why? Because you... Do not make, uh, you do not realize the negative consequences or the positive benefits of sending that email. And once you, once you make those things clear, then all of a sudden you have emotional drive. And you cut off all the other options because you think, okay, if I don't do this, I have very negative consequences. So, the first thing I have an exercise for you now that I want to do is to take out a piece of paper and to write on that piece of paper following statement. Me, and you put your name hereby decide to burn all the bridges behind me and to do whatever it takes for the next 90 days to get and you fill in your biggest current goal. I will prove to myself what I'm truly capable of and I will therefore experience greater freedom than ever before. I do not longer accept excuses and I will blow limitations away like TNT. I only have one life and I will start living my life right now. And the reason you have to do this for 90 days is that that's how long it takes approximately to um, get a new behavior settled in so it becomes automatic. If you only do it for one week, four weeks from now, you'll have forgotten what you did one, uh, what you did that one week. And if you brushed your teeth only, you know, one week now, then a couple of months it would not be automatic. You would not go every evening or every morning to brush your teeth if you did not do it every day. By the way, if you're not currently brushing your teeth on a daily basis, I highly recommend that you go and brush your teeth on a daily basis. It has a lot of benefits. You get whiter teeth and also you have a nice breath. Something to think about maybe. Some extra tip. Next, I want to talk a little bit about internal resources versus medication. Like I said, the first thing when people feel that, they feel that something is wrong with them and then they go to a doctor. And um, what I want to point out here is that medication for... Social anxiety disorder um, does not rare, well, it's very rarely treat the actual problem, but it suppresses the negative manifestations of the actual problem. And what does that mean? It means, for instance, PCNs or beta blockers or any other kind of, um, of medication for social anxiety. What it does is basically this. Well, it regulates your bodily functions, but more importantly, it blocks certain chemicals from reaching certain areas in your brain. And you can picture it in a way that, imagine you have bad mail or post, like high debt payments or mortgage payments, really bad, like something that when you got and you read it, you would feel bad about it. Now imagine the postman does not bring your mail. Like you never received those bad 
about debt payments or mortgage payments. You never receive them. So what, how would that, would that make you feel? Of course, you would feel better because you don't, you know, you don't get the bad mail. Now imagine you do not only not get the bad mail, but you get good mail. You get a mail that says, hey, you just won a TV and a trip to Disneyland. How would that make you feel? Well, make, make you feel even better. So what the medicine does, it blocks the bad feelings in a certain way, and it enhances, it works an enhancement on the good feelings. So naturally you feel better after taking them. Here's a risk and danger. The medication did not actually treat the problem. Your high debt payments are not gone. They're still there. You just found a way not to receive the, the bad mail. But it's still there. So if you do not deal with your actual payments, then a couple of months from now, you know, the consequences are going to be very bad. You might lose your house, you know, and then your spouse or your husband might, you know, leave you and then you might not even see your kids and all these, you know, things. And once you make those things clear, then you get enough motivation to actually follow through without medication. And what medication actually does, it's just like what it does, it suppresses the negative manifestations. That's the main thing that medication does. So that's why I think it's dangerous to rely on it. And long-term reliance of it um, will cause harm to your health in the long run. Now, I will point out here that I'm not a licensed medi uh, doctor, and I do not discourage people who are currently taking medication um, to let it go and to not take it anymore. I, on the contrary, I think it might be very helpful for some people, especially when they're at a very bad stage of um, social anxiety. But if you think about relying on it for the rest of your life, I, you can just, you know, ask it to reconsider, because it might not be good for you. Um, and if you say, okay, but what is the other options that I have? Well, I want to point out something very simple, that the human body has actually potential to heal itself. And a way to help your body heal itself is to get into the state that would allow you to feel as if you already were healthy. And it's really true. It's true on a very simple level and a high level. For example, if I cut myself, a week from now, the wound will automatically close and heal. That's amazing. I don't need to do anything. The body does it itself. And there's another story about a man called Morris Goodman. You might have heard of him, also called the Miracle Man. If you haven't, then I you know, recommend that you check him out. He sadly died two years ago, two or three years ago. But... Um, his story is amazing because that was a man that in his mid-40s finally made his dream come true and got his own airplane. Then he flew, but he crashed with his airplane. And he crashed his spinal cord and he broke a lot of bones in his body. And so when he arrived in the hospital, the, the, um, the doctors told him, you're not going to survive the night. You're so, in such a critical and severe condition that it's very likely you're going to die. Not only did he survive that night, but he also told them that, you know, nine months from now, he's going to walk out on his own feet from the hospital. And they said, it's ridiculous, the doctors, because you're not going to be able to do any bodily functions anymore on your own. You're not going to be able to eat alone. You're not going to be able to walk, talk, any of that. And, you know, nine months from that point, he made a commitment to himself, and he, he used the power of the body to heal itself. And it sounds like hokum, I know, but... You know, it's been documented. You can research this yourself if you don't believe me. And um, and he walked out of that hospital. Well, it took him, I think, two more years until he talked his first word and five more years until he was able to actually walk again. But, and after nine months, he was only staying, standing on his own legs. But that's not the point. The point is that he went contr uh, contrary to medical belief and uh, he showed them that, you know, you're wrong. You doctors are wrong, and I can actually heal myself again. Doesn't matter how severe it is. And that's amazing. And this has been uh, proven clinically over and over again by using placebos and nocebos. And results of uh, human expectations are what we call placebos in case they're positive or nocebos in case they're negative. And uh, the higher expectations of that, the better your results. So uh, placebo is an, a substance that has no medical value whatsoever. But the patient believes that it has, and therefore gets better. That's amazing. But there's no medical substance in that placebo. And so when a patient believes that they're going to get better, the placebo works in a certain way, 
and they actually get better. If the person thinks that they're going to get worse from taking the medicine, that also happens. It's a negative uh, way of it, and it's called, called nocebo. And what's interesting here is the bigger the instrument, the bigger the placebo, the, usually the higher the results. So if you have a small pill, it will work worse than if you have a big fancy machine that's going to, you know, heal you. Even though if none of these things actually have any medical value, they still end up healing you and making you better just because you're expected to away. And that's amazing. So, something to think about. And lastly, I want to point out that you are not broken and therefore you do not need medication. You can learn you use your mind and your body will follow. And what I mean by that is if you have problems breathing and you have something wrong with your lungs, obviously you need to go to the hospital and get some treatment because your bodily functions are uh, not the way it's supposed to. However, if you're socially anxious, there's nothing wrong with your organs or your body. It's all in your mind. So you don't actually need to be fixed or treated. You just need to learn how to how to master your own emotions and how to process the things that happen to you in a more beneficial way. Next, people then say, okay, but I get panic attacks, so I feel physiological manifestations of anxiety. So is that just like hokum or what? What are you, you know, what are you telling me? I, like, there's something wrong with my body. Um, again, I'm not a licensed doctor, but I have done my fair share of uh, research, and I have some facts for all the people suffering from panic attacks and telling me that panic attacks are the fact that something is wrong with them in their body functions. In fact, they are making themselves feel that way. It's not their body makes themselves feel that way, it's their mind and their body just responds to it. And here's some facts. Number one, anxiety never causes strokes or heart attacks. There's not been a single documented case that exists in which anxiety has caused a heart attack or a stroke. It doesn't exist. It's impossible. Number two, people afraid of passing out almost never pass out. And why is that? Because what happens is your heart starts beating faster and you start pumping more blood into your brain. So it's kind of hard to pass out with extra oxygen and blood in your brain. Just that thing. Three, panic attacks never lead to insanity or loss of control. In fact, the biggest thing to fear when having a panic attack is fear itself. Because once the panic attack is gone, it's this huge wave. It feels very uncomfortable while it's happening. But after it's gone, you know, you're left normal again. So, really, the biggest thing to fear there is the fear itself. Four, no physical or chemical imbalance is known to cause anxiety or panic attacks. What that implies is that nothing is wrong with your body, again, as I said. But it's all in your mind. There's no chemical imbalance whatsoever that causes you the anxiety that you feel. And five, some people are inherently more likely to have socially anxiety, uh, social anxiety disorders, which afterwards lead to panic attacks. However, I want to point out that nobody has to live the rest of their lives in constant anxiety. And also this cannot be used as an excuse because people, th people read that and then they're like, okay, so it has been proven to some extent that I'm genetically wired like this. And I was genetically born like this, so there's nothing I can do about this. Well, let me tell you this. I was also born like that. My brother was the kind of um, child that went to talk to everybody and was always very happy. And I was very reserved and shy, um, always when I was small. And what is the difference between, you know, those two pe people like that are very social when they're small and people are very shy? Well, the difference is that the people who are shy and uh, more constrained in new situations are, is that they inherited a chemical, uh, a chemistry in their brain, in the amygdala, which is a part of an emotional brain that evaluates emotions and evaluates the danger and the threats and so on. Um, that gives them a very interpersonal sensitivity. And what that means is to new unknown situations, these people react with uh, restraint. So when there's something new coming to them, instead of embracing it all and being curious about it, they act restrained. And this is like inherited in your chemistry, uh, in your brain. And so that is the only difference between those people and the other people. And uh, I used to be one of those, you know, very shy people. And if you forced me to talk to someone that I didn't know, probably when I was small, I probably started to cry. So, you know, I was one of those. 
and uh, there's been an interesting story. And one one time, I uh, I was playing a Santa Claus in a kindergarten, and I went to the bathroom. I changed. And I had this huge Santa Claus costume with this huge beard, and, and I went to the kindergarten, and I was supposed to give him the presents. So I went there and I started taking the presents out of my big sack and like reading. Okay, you know, this is for you know, this child and this child, and I gave all the presents. And they were like, oh, Santa Claus, blah, blah. Well, some tried to get my beard and, hey, you're fake. And whatever, it was fun. But there was one child. There was one present left. There was a small girl. And then I read it and was like, oh, so, you know, there's a girl. So I went to the girl and I wanted to give her your present. And she she hit under the table. She went under the table. She was really scared. And I was like, okay. So, you know, I started smiling. And, you know, here's a present. And she started to cry. And she started to kick myself like, mm, she, like, go away. And I was like, okay, you know, and I had to give the mother the present, so the mother would give her the present. But she hated me, and I was looking actually cute. All the other kids loved me, but she really was afraid of me, and she hated me. And that's the only difference, like those children afterwards, they have some degree that makes them actually a little bit more likely to be socially anxious in the afterworld life. But you can always, you can always change that. Like, you cannot use it as a is an excuse and it's also not a disadvantage in life towards other people. It's, it's just an excuse, that's what it is. So I want to talk a little bit about motivation, pain and pleasure and often here I just can't get motivated to follow through. And there's this um, nice picture here, nice grab I made, that shows how motivation usually works. There's positive motivation by, you know, if I tell you, write that email and I give you a cookie, you're like, oh, you know, I have positive motivation. I write that email and I get the cookie from you. So that might motivate you. Or I can tell to you, um, if you do not write that email, you will never get cookies again, ever. And, you know, it might not be a big deal for you, but imagine you love cookies. And then what would motivate you more? If I told you, you can get one cookie if you do it, or you will never get cookies again. And these are the good cookies we're talking about, chocolate cookies, the good stuff. So hmm, for most people, it looks like in the picture that the negative motivation is much, much stronger than positive. And it makes sense if you think about what's the best thing that can happen. Well, you get many cookies or something, you know, you get a good reward. But what's the bad thing, that, the worst thing that can happen in the worst case scenario? Well, death, you might die. So that's the end of your life. So you have to be more careful there. That's why the pain part is more strong, uh, is a stronger motivator than the pleasure part. And if you think about what makes you go to eat every day, it's the emotional drive behind it. The decision to eat comes from the hunger that you have. You have hunger. And what is hunger? It's pain. You feel pain in your stomach. You're hungry. So, that is much stronger motivator than if you think, mmm, if I eat that hamburger, I will feel good. Or I, it will taste so awesome. If that makes sense. So, it's the emotional drive behind it. It's the pain that makes us follow through. So if you use these two concepts and you combine them, and you make sure, okay, I get the cookie if I write the email, and if I don't write the email, I never get cookies again. And you really picture in your mind, you make yourself feel that. It's going to motivate you a lot, but you have to you have to take the time to make sure what the consequences are, the positive and the negative ones. <laughs> Next, I want to talk about to uh, about the second step to understand what you're doing and to break patterns of behavior. And the first point I want to make is to learn to change the meaning of events. Why is that? Because event plus meaning equals feeling. Okay, and people go, that's bullshit. You know, if something bad happens to me. It's a situation that creates the feeling inside me. Nah, it's not. It's the meaning you attach to that situation that creates that feeling in you. And then people say, okay, what about I get beaten up and, you know, robbed or whatever. So obviously that's the bad thing and, you know, that creates, it makes me feel like shit. Okay, if we talk about physical violence, it creates physical pain in you. I agree. But the actual feeling that you get, you know, you can have many feelings about that same situation. For instance, someone might feel sad because, you know, society is breaking down to the part where people just start hitting itself. Other people might feel angry because, ah, you know, 
you know, those motherfuckers, uh, excuse my French here, but um, <coughs> those people like stole me and beat me and other people just might feel, um, you know, rage inside of them and there's different emotions for different people. It's just because of the feeling, uh, the meaning they attach to what happens to them. And a good example might be Lance Armstrong and uh, he got testicular cancer, for instance. And this example is used many times by many people. And before he got the cancer, um, he never won a single tour of France or anything of that. And afterwards, after he dealt with the cancer, um, he went out to win seven, eight, or I don't know how many, but many tours. And, and he never did that before he had the cancer. So I can ask you, is that a, the event, getting cancer, was that a good or a bad thing? And many people, of course, getting cancer was a bad thing. But okay. But because of the cancer, and the meaning he attached to the, you know, to the, to having a cancer, he went out and created a better life than he ever expected and he ever had before. And then people say, okay, it was a good thing that happened. He's like, really? What if I told you you can have cancer? Do you want some? Obviously not. So it's not the event. You know, it's the meaning we attach. Because was it bad that he got cancer? Yes or no? It depends on how you look at it. And obviously, getting cancer is not a nice thing, but you get the point, how it can affect you and the meaning you attach to it. And also, um, imagine you're like, uh, there has been a story about an old person that was uh, driving in a car, and the car gets stuck on the railway, like, you know, where the train passes, but the person was kind of old, and it did not, it did see a train coming, and to make the story very short, uh, the person got saved. But it never perceived the danger because it did not really understand the brain didn't work, work that well anymore. So even though the person saw the train and the event was the train coming to the car and the car was in the middle of the, you know, right things, that person did not feel um, fear or any of that because it did not attach the meaning to the event. Okay, that train is going to crash me and I'm going to die. And as long as you do not attach the meaning, it does not matter what the event is. You're not going to have that feeling. The feeling is caused by the meaning that you attach to certain events. Next. So you have to learn to change the meaning. And what is learning? Learning is behavior change. If you learn something, but it does not result in a difference in your behavior, you did not learn. You understood something intellectually, but that's not learning. So learning equals behavior change. And now I want to look at a model that uh, has been used by many successful coaches and this has been further developed by Tony Robbins and uh, it's an awesome model that has helped me a lot understand what I'm doing and it's four four dimensions that uses potential action results and beliefs so you have some kind of beliefs right now and the beliefs about yourself create the potential if I ask you how much potential you have in this area well the potential you have in this area is determined by what you believe about yourself so you might have little potential or high potential and then your potential creates your actions. If you think you have a lot of potential, then you, your actions are going to be you know, more massive. If you think you have little potential, you will take a little action. And then according to the action you take, you get a result. If you take a lot of action, you get a lot of results. If you take little actions or poor actions, you get poor results. And the results are used to reinforce um, your beliefs. So if you have bad results, you tell yourself, oh, I knew this. You know, I, I knew from the start. See, I was right. You know, I, I told myself, um, I cannot do this, and see, I couldn't do it, so I'm right. Instead of realizing that the reason they couldn't do it was because they started thinking that they couldn't do it. And so I call this the poisonous and self-fulfilling cycle of behavior. And why is this poisonous? Well, it can be very good if you use it the right way. But for most people suffering under social anxiety, they have very poor beliefs about themselves. So for them, it's a negative circle that makes them get even worse and worse all the time. And there's two ways to break that the circle. You can either break it in your beliefs, by uh, working on your beliefs, or by your actions. And I'm going to give you um, two examples for each, how to break that. In your beliefs, you can work on changing your beliefs. And then you create automatically more potential, which leads to more actions. And you get better results. Or... You can do actions that were out of what you thought were possible. How do you do that? For example, when someone else pushes you to do something, and then you actually go through with it, 
And then you go, oh, wow, I did this. And you get good results, and you're like, hey, wow, I didn't know I could do this, but now I did that. So your beliefs change about yourself. Hey, I can do this. I can probably do some more, you know. So these are two ways to change that. Number one, example four, um, beliefs, how to change that. For instance, for socially anxious people, they might have a belief, uh, I have always been shy and therefore will always stay shy and lonely. What you do once you get that belief, or you're top five or whatever, then you think about, is this an empowering belief? Yes or no? And you take your top five beliefs and you go through them. Okay, clearly this is not very empowering. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to use motivation to get rid of them and to replace them. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to use the positive motivation and the negative motivation. So, you're going to be very specific about what will be the consequences of keeping this belief in your life. And For instance, I wrote here, if I believe that my past equals the future, I will always stay alone. I will spend my nights alone in bed crying. I will feel like nobody will ever love me and that I'm not worthy of anyone, another person's love. One morning I wake up, 10 years from now, my life has passed and this belief has robbed me from the, having friendships, the job I wanted, and enjoyment in life. I'm old, I feel tired, sad and depressed. I cry myself to sleep every day. This belief has destroyed my life. And this might sound very dramatic and this is only a small part. I actually wrote over a page. And this is an actual um, text I used when I was working on my beliefs because this is a belief I had. And I give you a small, you know, um, part of it, but I wrote in much more detail. But, you know, because of the space issues, I kind of limit it. Next, you have to replace that belief. So you need to come up with something on the other side of it to kind of replace that. So I replaced it with, I'm social lovable. People feel drawn towards me because I exude a positive energy everywhere I go. I have many friends, and I'm grateful for every day alive. And I wrote this probably three or four years ago. And uh, it pretty much became true. I have awesome friends, and I, I pretty much love my life right now. So it's amazing how these things work. And of course, it was not only this, but it was a combination of different things. But also then, what I did is I imagined the life I wanted to have. So I put on the positive consequences of having that new belief, and I wrote, I love my life. I cannot wait to wake up every morning to have breakfast with my loved spouse or partner. One morning I wake up, 10 years of my life have passed, and I enjoyed every single one of them. I have a wide, positive, and fun social circle, a cycle, the work I love, and I'm thankful for every new day that I get. Okay, and next what I want you to do is lie down on your bed, put on your favorite music or something that gets you into state, and then imagine both of these things. Imagine all the nice things you're going to get with a new belief, and imagine all the freaking pain that you're going to have with the old thing. And just, like, go through it, and, like, you're going to feel like shit. Uh, when you when you feel all that stuff, but it's gonna motivate you afterwards. You you wake up on that and you feel refreshed. And you're like, ah, I'm ready for action. If that makes sense, okay? And you have to do this on a regular basis, not only once, all the time. Next, zoom out of the room on fire. Now, imagine you're in a burning room. There is one window close to your bed, but a big flame in between the two, between the window and the and the bed. You have two pillows, a big blanket, a small bottle of water, and in front of the door are already big flames. You were sleeping, but the smoke woke you up. Question. How do you escape the room on fire? Do you risk your life and try to get out of the window? Do you get through the door despite the, the flames? Or do you even try to extinct the flames using a blanket and pillow? Think about that for a moment. You're caught in the room, and it's full of fire, and you have to get out of it. What do you do? Now, what do all of these answers have in common? The ones that listen, the ones you, you might think of. Well, it's quite simple. They all are solutions in context of a burning room. Whereas the easiest way to escape that room is to stop imagining it. And people go, okay, um, this is just stupid. You know, stop imagining, but might be, but if you think about it, I told you to imagine the room, and once you accepted that statement, all the answers you could go up with were in context of a burning room. And this is what you currently do when you make yourself feel any way that you currently feel. How? Simple. People that are suffering from social anxiety, they try to fight anxiety when it comes up. And they try to resist it and to fight it. And it never works. If anything, it makes it worse. Because they also get frustrated when it doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? Why? Because they are thinking in context 
of the burning room. So they're thinking in context of their anxiety, and all the solutions they come up with in that context uh, are not going to help them. Why? Because there's no possible scenario that will help them as long as they stay focused and thinking within the four boxes. So what they need to do is to zoom out of it and maybe realize that the things, the fact that they believe were true, are maybe not true after all. Some of that might be wrong, and you have to let go of the fixed perspective and to try to look at new things. But the moment you accept the burning room and you start imagining it in more detail and you actually really make you know, a clear picture, but the more you, you, you start to accept that belief and, and that scenario, well, the higher the anxiety and the pressure in someone is going to be. And this applies to any kind of belief, any room or any context that you, you make yourself believe. <laughs> And so, the moment you stop imagining it, all the anxieties and the pressure related to the burning room just disappear. And there's no point in fighting it as long as you think in the context of it, if that makes any sense to you. I hope it does. So, it's important to let go, fix perspective, and to look um, maybe at the fact that you might be wrong with the things that you think are right. And to be, you know, uh, willing to zoom out and look at it from a different perspective and not to think in context of the room and fire. Next. Again, I'm, I'm sorry. The flu. Uh, if you have the flu, I hope I hope uh, it passes soon because oof, I've had it for several weeks now. It's not nice. So next, um, we looked at how you can change things in your beliefs by attaching, you know, um, the consequences and, and making clear what, what's going to be the outcome that you want. But another thing is to do something new and something that you did not think was possible for you. And that's working on the actions, not only on the beliefs, but on the actions. And how will it work like this? Here, number one, the circle is your current comfort zone, the things you're comfortable with. And once you push yourself out by doing something that you're not comfortable with and you stay present and you actually go through with it, and you go the first you could go, and you know, I, I wrote here the first you could expand your current comfort zone given your skills and beliefs. There's actually no limit, but if I ask this very social anxious person who never talked a word to, you know, a stranger to go into a club and to make 100 friends, well, obviously that's not going to happen because it's so far out of their reality in the comfort zone that um, they cannot stretch themselves that far, that quickly. So. I put here like a limit that, you know, would um, represent the furthest one could potentially right now at the current skill level expand the comfort zone, when in fact there's no real limit. But So you expand it, you do something, and what happens is zoop, you go to three, and your current new comfort zone now is wider than the first one. And you have to do this on a current basis. And what happens is the things you get comfortable with grow. So you are now in a new scenario where currently you felt anxious, but now all of a sudden you're cool with it. You're like, okay, you know, this is fine. So this is how to do things um, by working on your actions. And you have to challenge your physical and your mental comfort zone. So your beliefs and your actions, the combination of both of these things are, are necessary. And what can you do, for example, for um, your physical comfort zone? Well, you can hit a gym. And this is a big thing for a socially anxious person because you might go there, you might be out of shape and you see all those people in shape and the first thing that the person will do is, oh my God, these people judge me because I'm not in shape, because I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm, you know, whatever. And, oh my God, that person has this great ass and, poof, you know, I need to train a little bit. So this is a big thing. But once you start doing that for 90 days, you will just, your life will be so much better in any way. And, or you could do a new sports class some, you know, join a new class with a lot of new people. Very scary for some people. Or you can do what I did. Well, I did all of the above, but I also did um, this year because I had a problem with making phone calls to random people. So I started making random phone calls and then hang up. And this might sound ridiculous to some of you, but some people have a lot of fear of making phone calls. So I took a random number, I called them up, and I apologized. Oh, sorry, wrong number, goodbye. And once I was comfortable doing that, I got a friend and we made this game that we called random people. We didn't really have anything to say, but we made this game. Who can keep that person the longest on the phone so that they would not hang up? And you make these games and 
And then you really get comfortable with that. And once you're comfortable talking to people on the phone, you can also talk to people online. And, you know, at some point you get very, well, it helps you a lot to get comfortable talking to people in real life. Okay? It's step by step, small steps. If you never talk to a single person, you go out in real life already to approach people. Hi. If you're not even comfortable doing a phone call, it's very hard for those people to do that. So first you want to go, you know, do a phone call. Comfortable with that. Then, you know, talk to people online. Get comfortable with that. And then go out. Because it's much easier to go from being comfortable of making a phone call and online to talk to people in real life than to go there directly, you know. That's this, you know, furthest you can expand your comfort zone. First, you know, the phone call. Then online. Then the real life. Real life is too far in the beginning. You have to take small steps. Okay, so next I want to talk about confidence because that's something you need to do these things. And I want to, I want you to think about confidence as a state. It's not something you're born with. Some people think, okay, he's so confident or she's so confident, and uh, you know, I'm not. And it's not something they're born with. It's something you cultivate, and it's a state of mind that you can trigger. And um, think about following. Think about the person you love most in your life. Okay. Now think about you're walking down the street and you see that person that you love so much and they're so dear to you and you see that person being beaten up by some random people and you hear them scream, you hear your, your loved one scream and, and you walk down that street and from far away you, you hear the person, you, I don't know, your little sister, your grandma, whoever the person is and you hear them scream and you, you see someone doing injustice to them. In that moment when you feel that, when you see that, I don't care who you are, I don't care how confident you are. There's this moment that, you know, all these chemicals will flop in your body and you will enter this state where you do not really accept anyone doing this. And, and I don't care how big the person is that doing injustice to the one you love. My guess is that every single one of you right now watching this will step in immediately without hesitation to save the person that you love. You're not going to let, you know, your loved ones get beaten up. No way. You're going to step in and you're going to be, you know, whatever it takes. If there's one thing you did in your life, that's, you know, step up for the one you love. And so you're going to go there and it's this one stage you enter in a second that you do that. Even if you're not a confident person in real life, in that second, you will be the most confident person on earth. Because there's something on stake here that matters to you. So it's a state that you can enter. It's a state you can trigger, actually. You have it inside. You just don't know how to get it out. And I want to give you also an exercise to cultivate a little bit more. And I want you to do this. Think of your last birthday in the past. And I want you to point with your finger in space to where you're looking when you think. So, think of my last birthday. Okay, there. And I want you to point with your finger. You see that, my finger? To the point where you see that in your mind. And that's going to be your past. And then I want you to take the other direction. And that's going to be your future. And now you have a, in your mind, you have a timeline, all right, with your past and your future. And I want you to mentally create that timeline and to lay it on the floor. So you can stand up and take a timeline from your mind and put it on the floor. And it can be two or three meters long, whatever. So it looks a little bit like this here. Okay? So here's your timeline. Here's what you consider the past. And you, you call it the state of weak confidence. And here's what you consider the future, which is a state of absolute confidence. At that point, you feel self-confident, you radiate self-confidence, you speak with self-confidence, and you feel positive and, you know, enjoy being you. And in the middle of that line, okay, is the present state of confidence. And you can rate it from 0 to 10, or whatever your present confidence is. You, you go into your body and you say, okay, presently I feel confident from 0 to 10, I feel maybe four, okay? So the present state of confidence is four. And in the future of the timeline, you know, two meters in front of you or whatever you made it, is 10, absolute confidence. And behind you is zero, okay? It's very weak. And what I want you to do is to stand in the middle of that timeline, close your eyes, and notice your confidence level right now. Imagine in front of you is absolute confidence. And imagine behind you is the weakest state you've ever felt. And the more you walk towards your confidence level, the 10, the more you start feeling confident. And the, the more you walk back, 
the less confident you start feeling. So what I want you to do is take one step forward and feel the difference in your body. And then go one step back and feel the difference. Then take one more step back and feel the difference. Feel what happens with your body. Your shoulders drop, maybe your head goes down, you know, you start breathing shallowly. And then I want you to take a step forward again. Take another step forward, feel the difference. Take another step forward, feel the difference. Take a step back, feel the difference. And do this and feel the difference until you reach 10. And you will notice by the time you reach 10, you will stand differently, you will feel different, your eye contact is different, you have a different presence about you. And you can just blow the timeline up and leave from there. And you walk into your life now with a more confident state. Okay? And you can also trigger that state by, you know, when you're really feeling it, you tap your wrist. That's anchoring your state. And you do that several times. And you go from that state into feeling crappy. And from feeling crappy, you go back into the state. And you train that so that when you feel crappy, you can very easily enter that state. And I hope that made sense to you how to do that. Um, this video is getting already very long, so I don't really have time to demonstrate how to do that. But I hope, um, I hope most people got the idea behind that. Okay? Okay, let's go on. Now, lastly, I want, to I want you to refill your mind positively and to reinforce new behavior. What does that mean? To anchor your positive states. Okay, when you feel great, just anchor them, you know. Realize what you do and you can anchor them in different ways so that you can train yourself to go into from a bad state into a good one over and over again until it becomes very easy for you to do that. Next, I want, to, I want you to unplug yourself from resistance. And what that means is I want you to ask the question, are they where you want to be? Because the moment you start changing, your family, your friends, everyone around you starts noticing it, and they don't like it. Some people might, but most people won't like it. Why? Because you change, and you know the things that they did to you or the way they interacted with you, they don't work anymore. Because you get more confident, more you know, assertive, more you get better with every day. So when they give you advice or try to hold you down, you might ask yourself this question. Are they where you want to be or have they gone through the struggles that you are going through? And if the answer is no, you might not want to take advice from them. You know, because a lot of people talk, but very few actually, you know, can give you the mentorship that you really need. So that's just a question. I know it's very hard to let go of friends that try to hold you back, but a lot of people that I... I knew that I consider my friends, they started getting, you know, very weird when I changed. And they started testing me all the time. You know, oh, it's just a phase, you, you won't go through with that, you know, you cannot do this, stuff like that. And it's like, you can also use this as motivation, you know, just to throw, just to show them, you know. Not only showing yourself, but showing them also, you know, I can do this, you can also do this. Stop trying to pull me down, I will help you get up. And if they still resist, let go of them, or don't, you know, don't spend too much time around them. And ask yourself the question, are they where you want to be? If you take advice from them. That's something, you know, you want to consider maybe. Next thing, um, dream. Dream every night before going to bed. And I want this, I want you to make this also for the next 90 days. Um, a ritual. Like before you go to bed, brush your teeth. If you're not doing that right now, I hope you really do. Um, then, you know, put on your pajamas. Or do your night uh, workouts some push-ups, whatever you do. And then before that, you dream five to ten minutes, and then you go to bed. And what I mean by dreaming is to lie down and to really dream. Because it takes no effort, and it's such, you know, such a nice thing to do, and it has a lot of benefits. So, just do that. Just go in there, and your bed, and dream for a couple of minutes um, where you want to be, and do this every day. Make it a habit, okay? Before you go to sleep. Next. And this is something that, uh, you know, just to really make you think about this. If I gave you 10 million euros or dollars in a year, if you managed to get 50 friends, which roughly is four new friends a month, would you do everything possible to achieve that goal? And I'm talking here now, of course, um, in context of socially anxious people, which is very hard for them to make four new friends a month or 50 new friends uh, you know, a year. It sounds crazy. Um, most of those people only have one or two friends. These are the same friends for many years, like close friends. So if I gave you this money, would you do it? And, um, you know, if you think about this, some people might say, yeah, you know, of course, if I get like 10 million, I would do whatever it takes. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. 
And then I ask you this, how much do you value your life? Do you value it more or less than 10 million? Why are you not willing to do it for the sake of a better life if you're willing to do it for so much money? Of course, if you get 10 million and you only have to do 50 friends or whatever your challenge is, maybe it's very hard for you to, I don't know, um, build up a list of clients and you need to get, you know, you want to get 20 clients every month or make uh, 20 phone calls every month. And, you, you know, if I told you at the end of the year, if you made 400 phone calls or whatever the number is that you want to have, or 1,000 or 2,000 or whatever, um, would you do it? And most likely you would if you get 10 million for it. So you're willing to do it for that money, but why not do it for the sake of a better life? Because essentially what you're saying is that you value the money much more than your life. And, um, you know, it might not be a good approach to do that. Just to think what is really important to you. And to do this for the sake of having a better life and being able to impact other people's lives more effectively. Just something to think about. Next, um, I want you to thank, uh, I want to thank you very much for listening to me and taking, you know, the amount of time that uh, you have in your life, which is very, uh, you know, very precious time. I realize that, so I appreciate that. And I want you to, I hope that it's it's helped to create an OS in the middle of your emotional desert and start living the life that you really deserve, my friend. And I really mean that because I know it's possible. And I, I feel great today. And I, I like the way, the, way, you know, the way I'm living and the friends that I have. And I see people struggling, especially in the country where I come from. Um, or the country I live in, which is uh, a country where people are very shy and socially anxious. And they settle for so many things just because they're not willing to step out of their comfort zone and break that the way of living that they've been living their whole lives, so, you know, I really hope this is a good value, I wish you good luck.